Triple A games are absolutely in the gutter. Double A and indies are taking over. Not too long ago, I talked about the degradation of quality in AAA video games, quadruple A gaming, actually, if you ask Yves Guillemot, CEO of Ubisoft. However, Hello? that's only one side of the coin. I can talk about Skull and Bones, a game funded by government subsidies for 10 years and then unceremoniously kicked out on the curb. Or I can talk about Suicide Squad, a AAA live service game from Rocksteady that is quite literally... All of this is peak gaming, if you ask me. Peak shit gaming, but it's at least hilarious died already if you don't believe me it's got less than 400 concurrent players on steam with a 24-hour peak of only 500 after just over a month but when talking about those games make no mistake there's a coexisting parallel reality here with absolutely incredible indie games that seems to be picking up the slack example number one controversial as it is would be pal world i say controversial because of the similarity between pokemon models and pals but the truth of the matter here, just going by raw numbers, fan base feedback, and community support, is that Pal World is one of the most successful games of all time. Yeah. At launch, the game had the highest initial sales ever on Steam, and one of the most important aspects we have to consider here is its price. And imagine it's secret. Just make a fun game. Just, just try to make a game that's fun. Ima imagine such a bold business strategy of making and developing games. Crazy. Price tag. Sure, the game capitalized on a multitude of contemporary trends, copied heavily from established IP, and had a red carpet rolled out for it through what's called earned media on a variety of platforms, but the price tag for this title was $26. Of course, that price tag contributed to a large number of players buying it, but price tag is now one of the greatest industry weak points, broadly speaking, subjected to the most egregious misrepresentations possible, as the community accepts something that does not need to happen, and should not be happening, as if it's a foregone conclusion. Skull and Bones, standard edition costing $60, premium edition 90 Suicide Squad, standard edition. Hell yeah, that's my Skull and Bones right there. A oh, beautiful, the best pirate game anyone has ever seen in their life. Mm-mm. Sea of Thieves? What, 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 what's, what's even that? No one knows, because Skull and Bones is the future, baby. Same with Suicide Squad. I can't wait until Suicide Squad gets their first DLC. It's gonna be the Joker. I'm sure that's gonna save everything. It's gonna, it's, it's gonna turn it around, boys. Trust me, trust me. It's like Redfall when they had their 200% uh, active player growth from 10 to like 30. It was huge. Trust me, it's gonna be huge. $70, Deluxe Edition 100, and those prices are becoming increasingly common. Here's the problem. Demonstrated quite clearly by shifted publisher revenue, the vast majority of income in the video game industry is now earned through a digital medium. That push has been going on for quite some time, seen as far back as 2018, when well over 80% of all sales were already digital. But the point I'm trying to make is that the shift from physical to digital fundamentally redefines the calculation parameters of price tag. The previous anatomy of a $60 AAA price tag was composed where at least $15 went to retailers. That number is actually quite comparable to what Steam gets right now, by the way, which many in the industry have argued is far too high. According to IGN, major retail companies like Amazon, Walmart, Best Buy, and GameStop take 30% of physical sales, just huh. like Steam. And after that, there's distribution cost, excess inventory, and physical cost of goods, leaving the publisher with a maximum cut here of around $27 per game sold. That's less than 50% of the AAA price tag, but what happens when you make the shift from physical to digital? And what happens when you begin forcing players into your own proprietary storefront? Well, I'll tell you what happens because it's pretty simple. The distribution costs go down to pennies on the dollar. They still exist, mind you, then, and they're quite a bit higher when you make the game always online and try to force everything to become a live service model, sure. But the distribution costs go down dramatically because you're essentially just selling a key and letting people download a file instead of printing it up, packaging it, shipping it, and then sharing revenue with a storefront like Best Buy. After eliminating basically all of their distribution expenses and also their retailer cut as well in a lot of cases for publishers, they're left with a tremendously larger slice of the pie. And yes, when distributing through Steam, they still have that pesky 30% fee. Bro, is anyone looking at this gameplay and thinking to themselves, wow, this looks like the most boring genetic shit I have ever seen in my life? I cannot be the only one. Holy a Suicide Squad delete the Justice League's Minecraft avatar just sad in gameplay. But they are still, always, 
harvesting more money from the distribution and sale of video games now than they ever were before. Why am I saying this? Yes, and actually half of that, even more than half of that, is because of in-game purchases. In-game purchases that... If you think in-game purchases are not bought and bought a lot and often, uh, you would be extremely wrong. Because if that wasn't the case, free-to-play games with microtransactions would not be able to exist. So, the fact that they just can uh, have the ability now to sell microtransactions already is like a huge point of revenue, okay? And, well, that's, that's just one part of it. Everyone wants to have their own Steam store, because one of the things that people don't understand about Steam is... What's powerful about Steam is not just the fact that they can uh, they do nothing and win by selling games that they don't even make. is the fact that Steam wins hugely on the market front, because every transaction gives them money. They're essentially the equivalent of a gaming credit, uh, credit card uh, processor. And credit card processing is a lot of money. Simple. As AAA video game publishers make more money, proportionally speaking, than ever before from selling their games, they are also raising the price. A lot of people might not be able to articulate why they feel this way, but the atmosphere of that product does not deserve that price tag is a growing mentality built on a pretty rock-solid foundation, where the audience is time and time again witnessing a schism between where it feels the industry should be and where the industry actually is. Today's video is brought to you by Incogni, which is all about all- Whoa, I love Incogni, said not anyone ever, honestly, probably ever. There's a lot more I could honestly say here. The services they offer and the value they provide is echelon. Having talked about the issue of price tags, it's time to pull everything together and complete the picture. Because hand in hand with the idea- God, the fact that Skull and Bones is so bad it doesn't even look like your ship's actually doing ship things, aka sailing- Man, that's just something else also, honestly. The fact that it looks like the ship is just gliding over water, kind of, and the water physics are this sad and bad is crazy. The idea of raising prices when you don't need to is community respect. Every single multiplayer game on the planet, whether it's PvP, PvE, cooperative, competitive, massively multiplayer, all of it, every single one, every single multiplayer game lives or dies by its community. A strong community will propel a game to decades of popularity, and a weak one will drop it as fast as the next competing game is able to release. One thing I always like to highlight on that subject is modding, because any developer who prioritizes and supports their modding community is giving themselves a tremendous advantage when it comes to community building. But sticking with my example from earlier, Helldivers 2 is another polar opposite extreme when compared to the current AAA landscape. Helldivers 2 is, of course, wildly popular right now, but it's popular for reasons that I don't think AAA publishers have adequately understood. It's popular, in my view, largely because the audience feels respected. There are entire Discord servers dedicated to making platoons and organizing some sort of governmental hierarchy in the game. There's mm. people role-playing and cooperating and simply enjoying themselves repeatedly because not only is the experience fun, but they also feel valued. In a way, that's an overarching gameplay choice as well, but more so than the numbers just going up and the planets getting freed or lost or what have you, the game doesn't make you feel like a pay pig. There's probably a better word than that, one with less underlying connotations, I suppose. But the gist of it is on point here, because Helldivers 2 is a $40 experience that quality-wise feels on par with pretty much anything we're getting right now out of the entire AAA cesspit. I don't know- That's not even the full story of Helldivers. The full story of Helldivers is that it's microtransaction-based, actually. You buy it, it's microtransaction-based, because there's a lot of it in, in the game. But no one gives a shit because it's a good game. Microtransactions, box price, honestly, none of that matters in my uh, in my opinion. The reality is, if 40 bucks is too much for you to buy a game, then you have bigger problems than, well, gaming. Because clearly your life is a fucking shit show. Because if 40... Dude, either you buy too many games, like, I don't know. I buy roughly one game half a year, honestly. That, that's how much I buy games, probably. May, maybe one every four months or something like that. A normal person should not have really that many problems buying a 40 bucks, 60 bucks, 70 bucks, even 100 buck game every four months. If you can't save that much money, 
You have bigger issues than, you know, the game that you want to play, okay? You're probably on the brink of becoming homeless or something. Get a job or something, maybe even. Who honestly knows? But clearly you have bigger problems than games. I think everyone who is complaining about, you know, buying a hundred dollar game is just... You're just completely irresponsible with money. Or you buy too many games. I don't know. I don't know how to fully describe it, but something along the lines of a shift happened. AAA quality games started to become more greedy with less innovation. And Obviously. indie games got hungry to make up the difference. At least that's how it feels. Maybe it all just boils down to risk tolerance. That's probably accurate, actually. I don't know. But AAA level experiences genuinely feel like they don't respect you, your time, or your wallet. Inversely, in... Well, yeah, that's very, very simple. AAA experiences don't uh, are all done by giant companies giant companies that are publicly traded and when you have a situation when when your average month is like this and suddenly you have a month or year that's like this you can't even see of how much of a success it is you're expected to have a, a month like that or a year like that after it so people don't want to experiment with risky things not because it's just risky. It's because if they succeed tremendously, they're gonna dig themselves. Uh, they they're digging essentially them, uh, themselves a grave the next year, probably. That is something that people that the people want to avoid. Like the people working in triple A, want to keep their jobs. They want to keep their bonuses, because you know. Again, a line always must go up is a very, very real thing in these industries and in every business that's publicly traded. Uh, Valve can do things like uh, can do things like that where they can ignore everything because Valve is a pub a privately held company. Gabe owns Valve from head to toe. He owns everything about it. There's not a single part that he doesn't own. He can make every choice. He can easily have a month where they make 50 times more revenue than previously. And then it doesn't matter for the next month because, you know, it, it's it's that they have no one to report to. And Gabe understands, well, we did good, but we're probably not doing it like that next year. Publicly traded companies don't have this luxury. So even experimenting with something that will succeed is kind of a risky thing because, well, if it's not constantly online and is not going to produce them a constant flow of money, they're just shooting themselves in the foot as businessmen. Which is bad, obviously, for them. Indie games often manage to exude an atmosphere of gratitude, kind of, I guess. It's obviously not that deep, and I'm kind of overthinking it here, but the small companies with a shoestring budget who decide to focus as hard as they can on just maximizing quality of experience are massively outperforming the big companies, especially in a relative sense, that seem to be maximizing everything other than actual player experience. Maybe some people aren't acutely aware of it on a conscious level, but if we stick with the idea that video games can be complex works of art, the comparison starts to make a lot more sense. On one side, the AAA side, that artwork is totally and completely commercialized in every sense of the word. Every single thing is being considered on the basis of how much money it can make, and every single thing has been streamlined by dedicated focus groups to be as lucrative as possible. Suicide Squad is a perfect example of this because it is now a total failure, despite being made as a game where its entire purpose was to last as long as possible and be played continuously. It wasn't made to be the best experience it could be and create enjoyment. It was made to capture attention via loot rarity curves and collectibles all mashed in alongside repeated grinding with the end goal of selling more in-game items. And yes, I know a lot of developers tried very hard to make this game as good as they could, but... I mean, the base premise was flawed to begin with, and the entire thing is just lacking. I just have to be honest about that. Helldivers 2 was made to be fun, first and foremost. At least, that's the atmosphere that I see. It was made to hold your attention, of course, and give you some sort of adaptable enemy presence, sure, but that's different than psychologically designing something just to hold your attention with gimmicks while selling you things. On top of that, it's a $40 game, which is $30 cheaper than this new normal for AAA gaming, which builds a sense of value from the very beginning because the horrible disconnect between price and experience is either massively reduced or gone altogether. 
That kind of subconscious comfort allows a healthy community mindset, and that's what we're seeing right now play out with Helldivers 2 and Pal World as they outperform literally everything around them, despite that competition being labeled by their creators as superior, simply because it came from a company that did at one point make some good games and has the title of AAA, but more yeah. recently they just- Make some good games in the past. Yeah, hey, it is what it is. All the AAA game studios did make good games in the past. That's how they made it big. No longer the point, no longer the case, though. How times change. Threw a lot more money into the marketing, it seems. Side note: Yes, I know there's some controversy in the Helldivers 2 community right now based on balancing and certain monetization decisions. But big picture, what I'm saying still holds true, even if the honeymoon period is less obvious than it was when I originally scripted this. In the end, indie games, by and large, at least. Quite a few of them are becoming extremely dominant right now because they manage to check off the same sort of boxes that a theoretical AAA title should check off with a fraction of the resources. Instead of tripping every single negative psychological alarm in their player base, they actually help foster a sense of value and community simply by way of their fiscal decision-making process. And all of it comes together forming an experience that makes you feel enjoyment rather than a constant underlying sense of tedium. What I'm trying to say is that indie games very often still let you feel like a player instead of a product, and the benefits of that are... Con that's true, because that's their only selling point, honestly, at this point. They need to be as good and fun as possible because they cannot rely on a lot of people just buying it and then buying microtransactions. It just does not work, true. Consistently self-evident. That's it. If you want to support the channel, please check out the links down below. Incogni, the videos. Anyway, that was up for this one. Upper echelon, just upper echelon. Still always want to say the G part. Anyway, this is Quizzer Sensei. Thanks for watching. Subscribe. Haven't already. Have a nice day. Bye bye.